Before we introduced Professor Juan Cole, I was just giving a little bit of logistics for people who are here about the mini course. So if you haven't done so already, please sign in in the back if you're registered for the mini course, both Pitt and CMU students. Okay? Second of all, on CourseWeb or Blackboard, both Pitt and CMUs, by Thursday, there will be the prompt for Professor Cole's lecture that we're asking you to submit it online, as well as a pre-survey that will need to be done before Friday's um, start of class. We will be sending out a reminder to everyone regarding this, but please you know, just be aware that we were asking you to do a prompt and to do a pre-survey. For your, for your fellow friends and, um, and colleagues who were not able to come to tonight's lecture, this lecture will be posted on Blackboard and CourseWeb so they'll be able to answer the questions that way too. Okay? Just as a reminder, the mini course starts Friday, that is November the 15th at 5 o'clock. It is in Senate Square, which is here on the University of Pittsburgh's campus. We will send out a map on Thursday so that everyone knows where it is and all, the entire course will be held in Senate Square. If you have any questions regarding the mini course, please after the lecture come and see me and I'll see if I can answer the questions, okay? Thank you. Well, I will introduce my colleague, Elaine Lin, who is the Assistant Director of the Global Studies Center. Good evening, everybody. I recognize a lot of our students here and my fellow classmates. Um, I have the privilege of introducing uh, Dr. Juan Cole. Uh, I have heard him speak over the years on Democracy Now! Radio, and if you don't listen to Democracy Now!, maybe you can stream it live, visit the website. Um, and Amy Goodman has a great taste in who she interviews and who she trusts. So for so many years, I've wanted to have him come to Pitt, and we're fortunate to have him speaking here. Um, one of you will probably see his three-page bio that I crafted with a much attention. And I did that because I wanted you to see kind of how his career has evolved over the years based on current events that have taken place in the United States, and also for students to see how his um, career kind of twisted and turned. It wasn't like a one-shot career path trajectory that many of our students, our undergraduate st students, think exists. And also his knowledge of language. He is fluent, I'm, I'm jumping the boat here, but he is fluent in Urdu, Arabic, Persian, and is familiar with Turkish. So that's something for us all to aspire to. Uh, Dr. Juan Cole is the Richard Mitchell Collegiate Professor of History at the University of Michigan. For three decades, he has sought to put the relationship of the West and the Muslim world in historical context. His most recent book is Engaging the Muslim World, and perhaps that Veronica said that's the textbook being used by our many courses, um, Muslims in a Global Context. And he's also recently authored Napoleon's Egypt, Invading the Middle East. Um, he's also translated work of Lebanese-American Khalil Gibran. Um, he is a regular guest on the um, Jim Lehrer Report, the Lehrer News Hour, ABC Nightly News, Charlie Rose, Anderson Cooper 360, Rachel Maddow, The Colbert Report, and Democracy Now! Um, he's written widely about Egypt, Iran, Iraq, and South Asia. Uh, he's commented extensively on Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Um, he continues to study and write about contemporary Islamic movements, whether mainstream or radical, Sunni, Salafi, or Shiite. Um, he was, I, now I'm going off my notes, that's not in here, but I think it's a really interesting story that he grew up on military bases and um, throughout the world, and in his teen years, which are pretty informative years, he was in uh, um, Eritrea, did I say it right? Yes. Um, during, um, from age 14 to 16 on his way home, it, they stopped at, um, in Beirut. And that was kind of one of his first exposures to the Middle East. 
He then went on to do his undergraduate um, at Northwestern University, also accepted Princeton. And um, he, well, there he studied political philosophy, literature, and um, religious studies. After graduating from Northwestern, he returned to, to Lebanon to get um, a master's at American University in Beirut, but that was right when the Civil War was breaking out. And actually somebody very close to him was assassinated, and I, yeah, um, in the war shortly thereafter. So he ended up taking, um, uh, going to Cairo, at American University in Cairo, and there he studied Arabic and, um, and history. After graduating at AUC, he went on to UCLA, where he studied Islamic studies. And um, once again, kind of the um, reflecting the times and the twists and turns of current events in the or recent current events in the Middle East, he was doing his research for his PhD on um, Shiite clerics. Okay, I'm going to butcher that part. Um, and, and, and he was going to go to um, Iran to study for his, his PhD research, and that's when the hostage um, takeover took place. So then he ended up going to um, um, India and Pakistan, where he studied Urdu. He got a Fulbright scholarship, studied Urdu there, met his lovely wife, and interviewed... Um, interviewed Iraqi war refugees in Urdu. Um, in 1984, he graduated with UCLA in his PhD um, with a doctorate, and then he went on to the um, University of Michigan, where he has been serving as a um, professor and became, I believe, full professor in 2000, I don't know, 2007? It's not important. Okay, not important. Okay, okay. Okay, well, for some in the room, it may be. Um, but what I want to say there is that he has served, you know how we have area study programs here at the University of Pittsburgh, he has served at Michigan as the director of the um, South Asian as well as the director of the Middle East and um, North Africa Studies Center. So there's a, a lot of knowledge from this man who's going to now speak to us. So thank you. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. One other thing I forgot. You have to check out his blog. He's one of the most active academic bloggers on the Middle East. Um, in Informed comment. Yeah, you have to check out. There's the URL. Yeah, there you go. That's it. You please go there for a source for information on the Middle East. Thank you very much, uh, Elaine, for those kind words. Uh, and thank you all for coming out this evening. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the kind of an update to my book, Engaging the Muslim World, which was a critique of US foreign policy towards the Middle East, uh, sort of the first eight years of the, of the last decade. Uh, we've got, we've got uh, uh, five more years under our belt now since uh, that book was written. And uh, let, let, me, uh, let me address uh, where I think things stand. Um, we began uh, the 21st century uh, in American foreign policy towards the Middle East uh, with uh, what's been called muscular Wilsonianism. Uh, you know, there's an old joke uh, from the Soviet Union period. Uh, you know, the Soviets were communists and they thought people should share the, the, the communal wealth. So they say a Soviet general once visited the United States and there was a lady in the audience who had trouble understanding what communism was. And he said, well, you know, Christianity urges you to do unto others as you would have them do unto you and to be nice to people and share. She said, yes. He said, it's like that, but if you don't do it, we shoot you. So, um, muscular Wilsonianism was, uh, you know, you have to be democratic, and if you're not democratic, we'll shoot you, uh, we'll invade you. Uh, the, uh, George W. Bush announced uh, a doctrine of preemptive war. Not 
Like preemptive war was not a doctrine that if you thought the enemy was about to attack you, it was all right to, to attack first. It, it would, the, the doctrine was if, the, if you thought there was an enemy out there that someday might consider attacking you, go ahead and finish it off now. Don't wait. Um, so, and there was a preference in that administration for military solutions. Uh, during the uh, last decade, the United States invaded and occupied Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, uh, and um, intervened uh, militarily in northern Pakistan. Uh, all of this kinetic military action uh, introduced enormous instability into uh, the eastern parts of the Middle East. Uh, the Bush administration represented itself as a force for democratization, for liberalization, for stability in the region, but in fact set off more wars uh, and more conflict uh, by its interventions. Um, and uh, there was, of course, the war on terror. Uh, that was what they called it. Uh, I, I, surely they meant the war on terrorism. You can't have a war on an abstract noun. Uh, but uh, uh, it was the global war on terror. And uh, um, I, G General Anthony Zinni, a Marine general who had been uh, the CENTCOM commander in the Middle East, uh, I, I once took a walk with him and he told me he'd been out of government a little bit and they brought him back in to consult on the whole and by and large the Bush administration blackballed him, but he, he managed to get a consulting gig and this uh, eager young uh, officer came in the room and uh, uh, said, uh, sir, we want to uh, know your, your views of the GWAT, sir. And Zindi said, the, the what? He said, the global war on terror, sir. He called it the GWAT. So Zinni thought it was the most ridiculous acronym he'd ever heard. Uh, he also didn't think much of the whole idea of a war on terror. He told me he thought that the Middle East going through a bad patch, it will all be over in 10 or 15 years. Uh, and um, uh, sometimes George W. Bush talked about a crusade. You know, there are some words in some contexts you probably shouldn't use. Uh, so um, uh, that didn't go over well. Uh, at one point he talked about Islamic fascism. So the Muslims in the Middle East thought, well, okay, Islamic fascism, let's get this straight. Fascism was an ideology developed by Italians, and Spanish, and it has to do with Islam what? How is that related? Uh, so that was also viewed as offensive in the region. So um, Barack Obama came into office in 2009 uh, with a public mandate to reverse many of these policies. Uh, the, the, the war in Iraq had turned into a quagmire. Uh, the American public, which had been very enthusiastic about that intervention. Uh, I used to just tell them at my weblog what was actually happening in Iraq based on the Iraqi newspapers, and they would send me all kinds of nasty letters uh, they, and, and emails. They, they really wanted to believe that this was going to be a shining city on a hill, that the U.S. was going to reform Iraq into a beacon of uh, something. Uh, and uh, I don't know, the other week, my dean asked me, he said, hey, Cole, how come they stopped demanding I fire you? I said, well, I think they've come to a better understanding of what's going on there. Um, so Obama, I think, was elected in part. Uh, as a reaction against the Iraq war and against Bush's intervention in the Middle East. And, and in some ways, he defeated Hillary Clinton in the Democratic primaries on that basis. Uh, so he came into office seeking an entirely different kind of relationship to the Middle East. 
He was going to withdraw militarily from the region. He didn't see a point in uh, this kind of kinetic involvement in, in that area. Uh, he, in my view, uh, adopted a, a kind of policy that some have called defensive realism. It's associated with the first uh, Bush administration, George Herbert Walker Bush. Of, uh, well, you know, uh, realism is a, is a doctrine in foreign policy that you don't get all sentimental and uh, worry about democratization. You seek the nation's interests. Uh, Henry Kissinger, who was an uh, aggressive realist, not a defensive one, uh, once said that uh, diplomacy is a game that is played with the pieces on the board. Uh, so you accept the world as it is, and you deal with it as it is, and you don't expect it to be better or uh, different than it is. And I think that's very much, you know, there was a realist core to Obama's uh, uh, policies in the Middle East. So. Um, he did want to make some changes, uh, but, and, and in particular, he wanted to do something about uh, the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, but on the whole, and by and large, he crafted a vision of withdrawing from the region, a withdrawal from Iraq and ultimate withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, he said the tides of war are ebbing. He, he made it sound as though it's a natural process that you know, it just so happened that it's happening during his presidency, as though it's not his policy to make the tides of war to recede. Um, and, um, and in fact, he put forward uh, a uh, he put forward a vision of uh, what was called a pivot towards Asia or a rebalancing towards Asia. Uh, uh, the, the, Chinese objected to the pivot part. It sounded like too much like an intervention, uh, so they, they called it rebalancing. But uh, you know, the United States does two two trillion dollars a year worth of trade with the Pacific Rim. It does four hundred billion dollars a year of trade with the Middle East, and most of that is hydrocarbons, oil and gas. So. You could make the case that the Pacific Rim nations, China and the Philippines and Japan and, and so forth, are much more important to the United States than the Middle East. And indeed, you could also make the case that if there's action in the future with regard to foreign policy, it's likely to be in the Pacific Rim uh, and not so much in the Middle East. Uh, China has been growing 10 percent a year since 1980. Uh, and some of the other economies in that region are also very dynamic. Uh, it interacts with the American uh, West Coast. Do you know that inside the city of Los Angeles, which is a very large city, both geographically and population-wise, there are 500,000 Koreans, Korean Americans. I mean, that's enormous. And you go there and you might as well be in Seoul. There, there, there's not even English language signage in a lot of it. Uh, so that's the Pacific Rim. And, and, you know, Obama is from Hawaii. All this stuff about Chicago. And so that's where he lived as an adult. But he grew up in Hawaii. And he's a man of the Pacific Rim. So uh, he, I think, wanted to not be quite so involved with the Middle East. It turns out it's hard to get away from. It's kind of dogged his presidency in ways that maybe he didn't anticipate. Uh, it certainly would be possible to have better relations with the region. Uh, in opinion polling, Muslim publics uh, express a desire for better relations with the U.S. Um, they, if you ask them what do you want from the U.S., they, they say fewer weapons, more medical aid and development aid. Uh, a lot of them want the U.S. to provide security. Uh, the, a, a lot of them say that they're uh, worried about terrorism. Um, well, why is the Middle East and the Muslim world more generally nevertheless important to the U.S., even if it's maybe not uh, the, um, the economic powerhouse that East Asia is? Well, first of all, uh, demographically speaking, uh, the world mm, 
is going to level off in its population growth sometime in the 21st century. And when it levels off, there will be between 9 and 12 billion of us. Uh, and very large proportions of those will be Muslim. By, the 20, by 2100, it, it could be as many as a third, uh, given contemporary demographic growth patterns. Uh, so, frankly, you can't be a great power if you have bad relations with a third of humankind. Uh, and so the U.S. is going to have to engage with that world. Uh, moreover, um, for the medium term, maybe not the very long term, but for the medium term, the world is very much locked into hydrocarbons. Um, we, we get to work by driving, and we get fuel in our automobiles, uh, by drilling for oil. And it so happens that uh, a very significant proportion, 70% of world oil res reserves, are in the Middle East and Central Asia, which are Muslim-majority areas. Uh, something on the order of 65% of world gas reserves. Now, this uh, situation is probably not very much changed by the hydraulic fracturing revolution in the United States, which has released more natural gas uh, in the U.S. Uh, Midwest uh, and some petroleum, only about a million barrels a day of petroleum, uh, because we don't know how deep those resources are. They're very heavily, it's a very heavily water dependent technology. Uh, the fields could be quite shallow, and in any case, so far, they're not game changers. The world produces on the order of 90 million barrels a day of petroleum. The U.S., by fracturing now, is producing about a million extra above what it had been doing uh, uh, 10 years ago. That's just not very much. It's a 90th of the total, and again, we don't know how, how long it's going to be able to do that. So. Um, uh, until, until we get a renewables revolution in this country that's very dramatic, so that we're running mostly on wind and solar and wave, uh, and that will come. You will likely live to see it. Uh, until that happens, however, we're very dependent on, on hydrocarbons. And not so much the United States, we don't import that much, but all of our allies, Japan, Germany, Japan and Germany have very little in the way of energy of their own. Now, Germany is trying to make a transition to renewables, but it's still only 22% of its total from renewables, uh, and that's after trying really hard. Uh, so um, uh, that, that area and that circle, that's going to be important to you for some time to come. Uh, then there's also the issue of uh, other kinds of security. Uh, the Suez Canal runs through Egypt. Uh, something like 10% of world trade goes through that canal. It's a, a wide canal, and so you can get the new big, huge container ships through it. Uh, that they, right now, they can't go through the Panama Canal because it's too narrow. They're widening the Panama Canal uh, to fit them. Uh, something like 8% of world petroleum uh, that, uh, that's shipped by, by sea is shipped through the Suez. Uh, Two million barrels a day of petroleum go through uh, pipelines through Egypt. Um, and although those are small numbers, 10%, 8%, 2 million, uh, actually the way the world works, the way the world economy works, is if that were cut off, if access to the Suez Canal were cut off and ships had to go around the Cape of Good Hope again uh, down uh, under Africa, uh, it would be a very significant economic uh, hit to the world economy. Uh, and if, if we lost 8% of petroleum uh, uh, exports at the moment, that would put gasoline prices way high. I mean, you'd be talking 6 $7 a gallon. Uh, so, um, you kind of want the Suez Canal to be there and to function. Uh, 
And it's going to make you a little bit nervous if you know these things, that there's like revolutions in Egypt and it's unstable. Uh, likewise, uh, there are big questions about the future of Central Asia, of what will happen in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, the U.S. is likely to withdraw mostly uh, by the end of 2014. Will there be a Taliban resurgence? India is afraid of that. Russia is afraid of that. Uh, Pakistan is afraid of that. And then we now are seeing uh, a situation where uh, there had been no al-Qaeda in Iraq. The George W. Bush administration alleged that Saddam Hussein and the Ba'ath Party, which were secular Arab nationalists, were somehow involved with al-Qaeda, which was not true, uh, and uh, were somehow involved in 9-11, which also was not true. They didn't come out and say that, but they, they hinted around at it. Uh, and uh, ironically enough, by invading Iraq and overthrowing the government and throwing the country into turmoil and creating a power vacuum, uh, the Bush administration allowed al-Qaeda to actually come into Iraq and develop a, a foothold there. And now, those uh, al-Qaeda operatives who had been in Iraq, some of them have gone to northern Syria, uh, where they've become involved in the rebellion against the Ba'ath government in Damascus. So you have not a fertile crescent, but an al-Qaeda crescent growing up, which is a severe security problem for the United States and its allies in the region. Uh, Obama did get out of Iraq as, uh, as he promised. Uh, the, the pathway to that withdrawal had already been laid by the Bush administration, which negotiated uh, a status of forces agreement uh, with, uh, with Iraq. Um, Iraq was unwilling, the Iraqi parliament was unwilling to grant U.S. military personnel uh, operating in Iraq uh, immunity from prosecution in Iraqi courts. Uh, and no military commander in his right mind would undertake a military operation in a country without such assurances. Because military operations can go bad, right? So if civilians get harmed or whatever, you don't want to see your lieutenant uh, in a courtroom uh, being judged by an Iraqi uh, judge. So since the Iraqi parliament refused to grant what is called extraterritoriality or legal immunity to, Ira to American troops operating in Iraq, they had to leave. There was not, nothing else you could do. Otherwise, you'd, you'd face war, war crimes trials in Iraq or maybe at The Hague uh, uh, at the International Criminal Court. Uh, and so Bush failed to get a SOFA uh, of the kind that he wanted from Iraq. He did get an agreement that American troops could stay in country until the end of 2011. And Obama presided over the withdrawal. Uh, and attempts were made to change the Iraqi parliament's mind, but they, they were foredoomed to failure. From the point of view of the Iraqi parliamentarians, uh, the American troops and their contractors had been rampaging around the country and had been involved in a number of, uh, of massacres and unfortunate incidents, and they were darned if they wanted any foreign troops in their country. In fact, Iraqis are very nationalistic and didn't want any foreign troops in their country ever all along the way, but they were invaded three times in a hundred years uh, uh, by, by the British and then the Americans. So it just was not on the, in the cards that they would accept an American presence. Uh, likewise, um, the Bush administration uh, dealt with 9-11 uh, in part by uh, occupying Afghanistan. Now, the initial Bush administration policy towards Afghanistan, I thought, had virtues. Basically, uh, the United States provided close air support to the Northern Alliance, to anti-Taliban forces in, uh, in Afghanistan. And they, with that American help, uh, defeated the Taliban. Uh, when the Americans first showed up, you know, the Northern Alliance had been abandoned by the U.S. and by most of its other allies, and they were kind of stuck in the north of, of, of Afghanistan, 
uh, and they were barely hanging on by their fingernails. So when U.S. Special Forces guys showed up, you know, they didn't even offer them tea, which that's a sign if an Afghan, if you go to an Afghan's house and he doesn't offer you tea, that's a sign he's not very happy with you. Uh, hosting is a big part of culture in that part of the world. Uh, so then the Special Forces guys said, but you know we can do things for you. And the Northern Alliance was skeptical. They said, what? They said, well, we can paint a laser on an enemy target and we can have it taken out because we have smart bombs. So the Northern Alliance guys said, show us. So they said, the Taliban commander's mansion is over there. So the special forces guys painted the laser on the mansion and then the F-16 showed up and bombed it to smithereens. So then the saffron rice came out and the big lamb and the, the juicy meat and the, the banquets were served and the Northern Alliance came to like the special forces guys. So they defeated the Taliban in only a few months. By the end of, of 2001, the Taliban were defeated all throughout the country. Um, but then, and I can't understand why in the world they did this, uh, the, the, the Bush administration decided to try to occupy Afghanistan. I mean, to actually have 100,000 or more U.S. troops on the ground in country and then similar numbers of, of NATO troops, uh, 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 the international uh, forces. And, um, and w w that was a recipe for disaster because Afghanistan is not a kind of country that can be militarily occupied. It's rugged, its people are clannish, and uh, there was this one State Department guy who quit. He had been out in a small village that had turned Taliban, it had joined the Taliban briefly, uh, and had rebelled against the government. And he went out, once they had given up the rebellion, he went out to do post-conflict interviews, and he asked the, the village headman, he said, why did you go into rebellion? Well, the village headman said, the damn government sent out the census taker to our village, and he was asking about the names of our women. Well, we had to kill them. So, in a, in a country where the villagers don't want the federal government to come of the country, and do a census, how do you f think they would feel about Marines walking around their village? So this was just not a plausible plan. And, and of course, you get attacked under such, such circumstances. Checkpoints get attacked, there's improvised explosive devices, there's sniping. And when you get attacked, you know you've been attacked from a particular village. And what would you do? You would go to that village and try to find the guys who attacked you. You would try to find the weapons that were used to attack you. And how would you do that? Well, you'd have to go into people's homes. You'd have to dig up their, their, their floors. Well, that's a pretty severe invasion of people's domestic space. And I can tell you, in Pushtun culture of southern Afghanistan, it's not allowed. You could do it, but they would have to kill you. Uh, so um, uh, this thing went worse and worse and worse over time. And, and basically, I think the Taliban were defeated in 2001, 2002. By 2005, they were starting to come back a little bit. By, by the end of the Bush administration, 2008, there was a full-blown neo-Taliban insurgency. Uh, not only in Afghanistan, but then it spread to northern Pakistan. So now you've got two countries in flames. Um, this guy is named Golbadin Hikmet Yar. He has the most ironic name in history. His name means the rose in religion. Golbadin, the friend of wisdom, Hikmet Yar. He's one of the most cold-blooded murderers of the 20th century, uh, and he's lasted in the 21st. Uh, he, um, he was given 
probably about a billion dollars by the CIA in the 1980s to fight the Soviet Union. Uh, but then when the U.S. occupied Afghanistan, he turned on them uh, and uh, uh, has been killing U.S. military personnel ever since. Uh, so that billion dollars maybe wasn't the best investment our country has ever made. Um, now, unlike Iraq, where uh, Obama was apparently willing just to let it go, um, he decided to try to put Afghanistan on the right footing before he withdrew. So, um, and maybe it wasn't so much Obama as the U.S. Pentagon, as, as the officer corps, uh, people like General David Petraeus, uh, who felt that they'd had certain amount of success in Iraq with counterinsurgency, and that they could maybe do the same thing in, in Afghanistan in preparation for a withdrawal. Now, counterterrorism and counterinsurgency are two different things. Um, counterterrorism is when you root out terrorists and you destroy their movement, you kill them, uh, and so forth. Counterinsurgency is when you take on a broader military and social struggle, an insurgency, which usually has some popular support and involves fair numbers of fighters. It's not just terrorism. An insurgency is a rebellion against the constituted government. Well, in order to counter insurgency, you need to do politics. You need to make friends with people. You need to protect them. Uh, you need to change minds. So Petraeus and others sold Obama on this plan of counterinsurgency in Afghanistan. And in my view, it was never a very plausible plan. Uh, it, it, you know, it would have required enormous military commitments. Uh, and Obama did up the number of U.S. troops in Afghanistan, uh, but not on the, on the scale that would have been necessary to accomplish a counterinsurgency campaign. Uh, and in my view, it failed. There were some successes along the way, uh, and General Petraeus will tell you about them at great length if you ask him, uh, but I don't think that overall you could say that the counterinsurgency in, in Afghanistan succeeded. Um, Moreover, part of the counterinsurgency would have required that the U.S. have a reliable ally in the Afghan government, and the Afghan government is not a reliable ally. It's headed by Hamid Karzai, who was kind of shoehorned in uh, uh, as president of the country uh, by the Western powers, and uh, who is quirky. Uh, he does things like some congressmen went to see him a couple years ago, and he, uh, uh, they, they reprimanded him for some mismanagement of the country. And he said, I had a choice between joining the Taliban or joining the United States. Sometimes I think I made the wrong decision. That's our ally? I can't tell you how many billions of dollars we've given him and his government. But he's kind of not sure, you know, yet whether he wants to join us or the Taliban. Uh, he stole the last presidential election in 2009 uh, quite uh, cheekily. Um, and the, the U.S. policy in, in Afghanistan is to try to build up the Afghan National Army in hopes that we could turn the country over to it when, when we leave. Uh, but the Afghan National Army, which has grown very large, 100,000 troops or so now, um, has some problems. First of all, we're not getting the best Afghans in the army. Uh, the literacy rate in Afghanistan is about 22 percent. Literacy rate in the army is about 10 percent. You know, it makes it hard to operate the army if they can't read and write. You know, if you got to Kandahar and you needed to go do an operation in a particular intersection, you'd have to ask the Taliban where that was. You can't read the signs. Uh, then there's a certain amount, and this happens in all armies. It was true in our army in Vietnam. But 
there's a fair amount of drug use, uh, a lot of potheads in the military. There's high rates of desertion. People don't want to really be there. They don't feel like they're being paid well enough to risk their lives. Uh, there's a, a, a huge amount of corruption in the officer corps and in the Afghan elite generally. In fact, the international community in the United States put billions of dollars into Afghanistan's banking system in order to try to stand up a modern banking system that would be the backbone of the country's prosperity. And Karzai's uh, colleagues uh, looted one of these banks. They, they, they took loans out of it that they had no intention of paying back. And they bought Dubai real estate in 2006 and seven. What happened to the world real estate market in 2008? It went on down to zero. And since the mansions and real estate in Dubai were backstopping the loans that had been taken out, what does it mean about the bank's assets? Didn't have any. So there were runs on banks, it was like our Great Depression, people didn't trust the banks, and they collapsed, uh, and um, uh, things are still very, very shaky. And all of this was corruption. The people who were involved in it were close to Karzai. Um, so the US is gonna get out of Afghanistan at the end of 2014, and uh, 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 for the most part. There's still negotiating going on about whether the Afghan government, unlike the Iraqi one, will grant some U.S. troops extraterritoriality. Maybe 5,000 or so will be left behind. Uh, but that's not entirely clear whether that will happen or whether the U.S. will get out altogether. But this long-term disengagement from the region is going forward that Obama had planned out. New forms of engagement, however, are being pursued by Obama. Uh, one of those uh, we saw dramatic events about this weekend, which is a negotiation with Iran about its nuclear enrichment program. Now, the nuclear enrichment program in Iran is objectionable to Israel, it's objectionable to Western Europe, and is objectionable to the United States. The reason for this is that the Iranians are using gas centrifuges to enrich uranium. They say that they're just making fuel for, for nuclear reactors the same way that lots of other countries do, Japan and France, for example. Um, but the problem with gas centrifuges as a way of enriching uranium is that they're open-ended. So if you feed the uranium through so much of the centrifuges, you, you can enrich them to three and a half or five percent, that's what it's needed for fuel for a reactor. But if you keep enriching, you have more and more centrifuges and you put the stuff through more and more times, you get up to 90% enrichment, and 90% enrichment, if configured correctly, can make a bomb. So if someone's running a lot of centrifuges, how would you know whether they're enriching for fuel or whether they're actually making a bomb? So it makes people nervous that Iran has this centrifuge enrichment program and, you know, uh, it's, it's a kind of new problem. It's, it's, it, the technology cropped up after the, the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty was uh, formed in the late 1960s. So um, Pakistan used those gas centrifuges to make its nuclear weapon, which it blew up in 1998. Uh, and Israel in particular is deathly afraid that the Iranians are about to do the same thing. Unlike Pakistan, however, Iran is a signatory to the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty and is regularly inspected by UN inspectors. The UN inspectors aren't completely happy with Iran. They don't think Iran is quite transparent enough, but they do certify that no uranium has been diverted to weapons purposes. So it's an ambiguous situation, you know? Are the Iranians up to something or are they not up to something? Are they just you know, making nuclear reactors. Some people say, well, why do the Iranians need nuclear reactors? They have all those hydrocarbons. Uh, but the Iranians want to sell the hydrocarbons on the international market and get foreign currency exchange, uh, reserves. And 
if they pr supply their own people with energy from the, the nuclear reactors, they can, they can save the hydrocarbons for, for export purposes. And the United Arab Emirates is making a nuclear reactor. Lots of countries that have hydrocarbons, including the United States, have nuclear reactors. So that's not really an argument. There's a legitimate reason for which the Iranians might want to run these reactors. Uh, personally, I don't think they want to bomb. I can't convince anybody else of this. Although I will point out that it's been a long time that we know that they've been running these centrifuges and they still haven't made a bomb. Uh, but um, I think what they want is what Japan has, which is uh, a breakout capability, an ability to make a bomb if they thought they were going to be invaded by somebody. You know, I found out the, the Japanese have four tons of plutonium reserves. What would you do with four tons of plutonium? That's a lot of plutonium. And they're just storing it. That seems to me suspicious. If I were China, I would have my eye on that plutonium. Uh, well, I think that's what the Iranians want. Is they, they want an ability uh, to break out uh, nuclear-wise if they felt existentially threatened. In the, in the absence of an existential threat, I think they don't want a bomb. Because North Korea got a bomb and all it brought was world isolation and, and sanctions and it's been a huge headache for North Korea. Uh, and I think the Iranians don't want that kind of trouble. Uh, so um, I'm not alone in my theory that the Iranians want a breakout capacity, but it's not the, the prevailing wisdom in Washington or Tel Aviv. Uh, in any case, Obama wants to negotiate with the new president of Iran, uh, Hassan Rouhani, uh, and, and the idea would be to have the Iranians prove that they only have a civilian program, that they don't want a militarization of their nuclear program. So how would they prove it? Well, they'd have to open themselves to more thoroughgoing uh, inspections. They'd have to uh, maybe cut down on the number of centrifuges that they have where they have enriched above 5%, they'd have to give that up, and so on and so forth. Uh, probably there's a deal to be had there, uh, and uh, apparently this uh, weekend, uh, the, the Western powers, uh, the, the United Nations Security Council plus Germany, uh, the, they call P5 plus 1, were very close to uh, not an agreement, but a confidence-building measure where Iran would cease enrichment activities for six months, uh, during which uh, there would be some slight sanctions relief because the sanctions that the US and the world community have on Iran are very, very severe uh, and have hurt their economy. Uh, and then during that six months, further, uh, further steps, further negotiations would take place. Uh, that was a, a deal that was very close to being signed on Saturday, and John Kerry, the S Secretary of State, called the Russians and the uh, Chinese to send in foreign, uh, foreign uh, ministry personnel, and, uh, and, and everything was getting ready for, for the signing ceremony. And then the French showed up, and Laurent Fabius walked into the room and said, well, this doesn't look to me like much of an agreement. You haven't done this, you haven't done that. Mm, no, it won't be allowed. So, no agreement. The French scuttled it. Uh, and what Fabio said was that, you know, a six month confidence building period in which Iran doesn't enrich isn't worth anything. Why would you give them sanctions relief for that? Let's, let's see them step up and, and do something serious uh, about reducing their capabilities. Um, but they're going to come back in two weeks and there'll be further negotiations. And I think this is something Obama and Kerry may have a chance of succeeding at, and I think the Iranians want it. Um, on the other hand, uh, Obama has made two passes now at trying to get the Israelis and the Palestinians to make an agreement. Uh, the Palestinians and the Israelis don't want the same thing, and so they can't agree. Uh, the Palestinians want uh, Gaza, the Gaza Strip and the West Bank uh, as their state. Uh, the, there is no constituency in Israel for a Palestinian state. 
and while the Israelis have relinquished Gaza as an object of actual colonization, they have it surrounded and besieged and they don't let very much uh, in the way of uh, building materials and other uh, necessary goods in. They don't let the Palestinians in Gaza export anything that they make or produce. So they've reduced that place to dire poverty uh, and food insecurity. Uh, and on the West Bank, uh, they, the, the Israelis are assiduously taking more and more territory for their own, uh, for their own settlements. Uh, so, and they have gone on doing that while they've been negotiating in this round with John Kerry and the Palestinians. Well, that's not going to end well. Uh, and so the, the likelihood of, of uh, there being a, um, uh, an agreement there seems to me to be very low. In fact, I don't entirely understand why Obama and Kerry are even trying at this juncture. Uh, you've got one of the more far-right governments in Israel's history, very dedicated to annexing the West Bank. Uh, and uh, the Palestinians themselves at this juncture are very divided. Uh, so it doesn't seem to me a very propitious conjuncture for an agreement. Uh, and then today, uh, uh, the uh, Avigdor Lieberman was uh, sworn back in as foreign minister. Avigdor Lieberman is from Moldova, and uh, he had been a club bouncer in his youth. And uh, I think he kind of wants to bounce the Palestinians from the club. Uh, he, he says he wants to take citizenship away from Israeli Palestinians uh, who aren't sufficiently loyal to the state, uh, and he's very devoted to this colonization process in the West Bank. Uh, and he, if you can imagine this, is substantially to the right of Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, who is one of the more right, far right wing pr prime ministers Israel has had. So uh, that, that uh, Lieberman is now on the cabinet and has a voice, it seems to me probably is the death knell of this round of, of those negotiations. Um, these recent changes that Obama has been making have uh, produced other reverberations in the region, and I'm coming to an end here, but uh, Saudi Arabia is very unhappy with U.S. foreign policy at the moment. Saudi Arabia is a very close ally of the United States. The U.S. and Saudi Arabia have almost nothing in common politically uh, or culturally. Uh, but the Saudis are the swing producer, they're, they're the world's largest petroleum exporter, uh, and uh, they're a relatively poor, weak country which needs a U.S. security umbrella. So they produce the petroleum, we provide the troops. It's, it's, been, a, uh, it's been a happy relationship uh, since uh, uh, President Roosevelt uh, met with King uh, um, uh, Abdulaziz uh, in 1945, uh, but um, it, it, it's been rocky the last few months, and the Saudis uh, have announced that they're unhappy about a number of things. First of all, they're not happy about these, these negotiations with Iran, uh, because like the Israelis, the Saudis are very suspicious of Iran and its motives and its nuclear program, and they're afraid that, that Obama is naive and he'll let the Iranians somehow stealthily make a bomb the way the Pakistanis did. Since the Saudis probably paid for the Pakistanis program, they know all the ins and outs of how you do this kind of thing. And uh, they, they think that if, if the Pakistanis did it, the Iranians probably want to do it too. Uh, then uh, there was a moment in September, as you know, that Obama looked like he might intervene in Syria. Uh, to punish the regime for using chemical weapons. Uh, and if he had intervened, probably he wouldn't just have bombed a couple buildings in Damascus, but would also have bombed some airports that the regime uses for resupply. Because, you know, there's a lot of the country that regime convoys can't go through anymore, and the troops can't get ammunition and, and reinforcements. So, uh, but it, they, they, they fly them in. But if you took out some of those airports, it might tip things towards the rebels. The Saudis really wanted Obama to do this, and Obama looked like he was going to do it, and then all of a sudden the Russians said, well, don't do that, we'll have the chemical weapons inspected and, and sequestered instead. And since Obama 
was by that time very isolated in a difficult position. He took the Russian deal. You know, Obama started when the Syrians used chemical weapons, uh, started by expecting that the Arab League and the United uh, Nations and NATO and the British would all be behind him uh, and Congress. But then the Arab League met and they didn't call for a Western intervention and the, the Russians and the Chinese blocked any resolution at the UN Security Council and then it went to NATO and the Belgians denounced intervention and you know when the Belgians turn on you, your, your, your cause is lost. Uh, and then the British Parliament voted and they said no. Uh, and, and then it looked as though Congress would, would tell Obama no too when he went to it. So he kind of was like Custer, you know, running up that hill. And he looked behind him and there weren't any troops back there. Uh, so when the Russians said, well, you know, don't do that, let's inspect instead, Obama said, shh, inspect away. Uh, but the Saudis were furious because they, they wanted the intervention. Uh, and, um, uh, and then they're not happy with the obvious coming failure of the Kerry negotiations on Palestine either. So from the Saudi point of view, you know, what good is the United States right about now? It's not doing anything about Syria. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's playing footsie with those Persian Shiites uh, in Iran. Uh, and it's, uh, and it's, it's, it's not even able to get uh, its client state Israel to behave uh, properly as the Saudis would see it uh, in the region. So the Saudis had been elected to a, a seat on the UN Security Council uh, uh, and they now have said that they're in a huff and not, not going to accept it. Uh, I was in Japan a couple weeks ago and the Japanese wanted that seat and you know it takes years to convince because it, it's the Asian seat. It takes years to convince the countries to vote for you and let you have it, and, and, and that the Saudis got it and then just threw it away was, was really infuriating to the Japanese. So, um, Obama got out of Iraq. Uh, he, uh, he had some success in convincing Pakistan to uh, turn on the Pakistani Taliban, uh, and he um, uh, probably failed in his attempt to reformulate Afghanistan, but he's getting out of it anyway. Uh, but he's got a stalemate in uh, Israel. We still haven't seen strong uh, momentum in Iran and Palestine. Uh, ultimately, it does seem to me that at the end of the Obama administration in, in 2016, that the U.S. posture in the Middle East will be much reduced from what it was at the beginning of the century. Uh, that we began the century occupying two major countries. Uh, that that kind of robust engagement with the region uh, is subsiding. Uh, and uh, that the relationship of the United States to previously extremely close allies like Saudi Arabia and Egypt is clearly lessening over time. Uh, and that uh, uh, this, this region uh, is maybe not of primary interest to President Obama, that, that he thinks that the real future of the United States lies in the Pacific. So I'll leave it there and take questions. Thank you very much. States of America. Now, you're very optimistic about the, the, uh, the future in terms of USA in the Middle East, but so long, I mean, it seems to me that so long as the current sort of government uh, in Israel has the stranglehold on the US Congress and the military industrial complex that exists in the USA and the dependence on 
war as a part of the American economy, things are not going to improve. Um, it's, were it not for Russia and China, I think we would be in a real mess now. Um, so I, I'm really interested to see what you uh, feel about the future of Israel, uh, USA. And of course, I'd also just mentioned that I'm not sure exactly when the war on terror or terrorism started, but maybe was it uh, after the 9-11? Uh, and so 9-11 has had the most enormous effect in the world, and particularly on USA and, and feelings about the Muslim world. And there are some doubts as to whether 9-11 was actually what it was is purported to be. If that turned out to be the case, then we're in a totally different ballgame. Well, with regard to U.S. and Israeli relations, and particularly uh, with regard to um, uh, Congress and Capitol Hill, um, I, I don't like to use a phrase, a word like stranglehold. I, I think that uh, there are alliances, and those, those alliances are made for reasons. Uh, I think the, uh, there's, there's something in the United States called Christian Zionism, uh, uh, representatives from strongly Baptist states uh, don't uh, typically uh, spend a lot of time bashing Israel uh, uh, because there's a, a doctrine among Christian Zionists that uh, Christ is coming back fairly soon but won't come back until all the Jews are gathered in, uh, in Israel and, and the Jews own all of Israel including the West Bank. So there are people in our Congress who believe in this, frankly, fairy tale, and who want to make policy on the basis of it, uh, and who uh, object to uh, the current carry negotiations on the grounds that, you know, might interfere in this apocalyptic uh, unfolding of events. Mind you, these people are not necessarily pro-Jewish. In fact, their vision is that uh, Jesus' return will cause all the Jews to convert to Christianity. So be the end of Judaism is what they're trying for. Um, but it, it, Christian Zionism is a, uh, an identifiable and significant strain in, in the US Congress uh, and is, uh, is in part responsible for some of the, um, let us say, less than even-handed positions that Congress takes on this issue. Uh, in addition to which, as we all know, there is an, an industrial, uh, a military industrial complex, and uh, it makes a lot of money selling weapons to, the, to, to Israel and to the Middle East more generally. Uh, and uh, that's another reason to, uh, to vote in a particular way on some of these issues. Uh, and, and ultimately what I would say is that, uh, you know, Harry Truman uh, was asked uh, when Israel was formed whether he was going to support it uh, despite the uh, expulsion of many of the Palestinians from their homes that it entailed. And he said, well, I have a lot of Jewish constituents. I don't have any Palestinian ones. And that is still true. Uh, and that's how, how politics in the United States works. There's nobody on the other side of that issue in domestic American politics. On the other hand, you know, the president uh, has a lot of prerogatives in these kinds of things. So. Uh, he can drag his feet, uh, he, can, uh, he can give waivers, uh, you know, he's not without power. Uh, and so some things can be accomplished in foreign policy even if Congress is not completely on board. And I think if Obama gets an agreement with uh, President Rouhani on, on the Iranian enrichment, that will certainly, that, that, that agreement will certainly be opposed by the majority in the present Congress. Uh, but the president uh, can reduce sanctions on Iran unilaterally, and there's nothing much Congress could do about that. Uh, so um, with regard to uh, the future of, of the region, um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a historian, not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a prophet, and uh, this is Yogi Berra is said to have remarked that, that, that prediction is extremely difficult, especially with regard to the future. Uh, so. Um, I, I didn't intend to suggest any particular outcome uh, here, but I, I, I am trying to outline uh, the, the shape of, American, of evolving American foreign policy in the region. And what I see is 
uh, a disengagement uh, uh, from, from many old allies and, and formerly, and regions where formerly a lot of resources were committed, like Iraq, and, and engage, a new kind of engagement with, with some old enemies like, uh, like Iran. I think there's a mic. We have a, here. In October, I saw a lecture by Avi Jorish, who is the founder of the Red Cell Intelligence Group, and he um, has done extensive research on Iran, primarily in banking, and he felt that in his findings, because he found that 20 of 30 Iranian banks um, launder money um, at times to Hezbollah, and that, um, no, all of them launder money at times to Hezbollah, and 20 of the 30 um, fund IEDs. And he felt that due to this information, were Iran ever to <coughs> gain the nuclear bomb, it would lead to a crisis um, extending beyond the severity of the height of the Cold War between the U.S. and the USSR, and that um, the new U.S. and Iranian relations from Iran's new president are totally farce, and that any hope of warmth and openness is not going to occur. And I was just wondering what your opinion about these remarks were. Yeah. Well, I don't disagree about the remark about warmth and op openness. They say in Washington, if you want a friend, buy a dog. Um, <laughs> we're not talking about friendship here. But um, no, I think that's scaremongering about Iran. Uh, first of all, you know, there's a tendency in American foreign policy to demonize people and, and, and whole countries. and uh, also to blow them up out of proportion. So Hezbollah is a militia group and also a political party, which by the way has seats in the Lebanese cabinet uh, and parliament. But uh, le it's a militia group uh, that represents the Lebanese Shia who were occupied by the Israelis for 20 years and who mobilized to get the Israelis back off of their territory. Well, it's a national liberation movement to some extent. Of course, from the Israeli point of view, groups that mobilize to prevent Israel from occupying their territory are terrorists. So the United States has adopted that definition of Hezbollah. Now, Hezbollah has occasionally actually committed terrorism, which is defined in the U.S. federal code as a non-state actor deploying a violence against civilians for political purposes. Uh, but Hezbollah is not exactly a non-state actor because the Lebanese government has asked it to form to be the National Guard of Lebanon in the south of the country. So it doesn't exactly fit that definition. And many of its targets have been Israeli military. Who, who, you can't, that's not terrorism. It could be an act of war, but it's not terrorism to attack troops. So um, the other thing to say is that there are a million and a half Shia in Lebanon. Not all of them support Hezbollah. In fact, about half of them vote for it. A lot of people in polling say they vote for it even though they're not very religious. So really, a movement with a, a population base of 750,000 is a dire threat to the United States? I mean, how likely is that? I mean, how many Hezbollah fighters are there even? Uh, and what do they have, these little Katusha rockets and things? So, you know, Using, building up Hezbollah into this boogeyman and then using it to indict Iran because Iran supports it. I mean, the whole thing is, 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 a, is a tissue of, of fantasy. Iran is 78th in the world for per capita income. Its military budget is somewhere between that of Norway and Singapore. It's not important. It's not, it's not the Soviet Union, which is what you keep hearing these congressmen give speeches in which they said the new Soviet Union now is Iran. I mean, that's ridiculous. It reminds me about in the mid-80s, Reagan was trying to build up Libya as the great threat to the United States, and Libya had three million population at the time. Uh, so um, this, this uh, sort of demonization of Iran and building it up to be this uh, major threat is silly. And what's being said is that if the Iranians did get a nuclear bomb, 
that they'd give it to Hezbollah, they'd give it to some terrorist group, which then would like blow up Brooklyn with it. Uh, well, that's not a plausible scenario. Uh, if you had an atomic bomb, would you give it to somebody else? How would you control them? What if they blew you up with it? It's never happened. I mean, and, and, and you know, we survived the Soviet Union, which was a real country, you know, big and large with lots of people and a five million man army with tanks pointed at our troops in Central Europe. We survived that for 60 years and they had hydrogen bombs. And uh, if Iran got one of those little nukes like Pakistan has, that's going to be the end of the world. And the Iranians are so irrational that they would like give it away to, to small terrorist groups. I mean, the whole thing is ridiculous. I'm sorry, but it, it just, it's, a, it's a way of thinking that's only plausible if you spend large amounts of time in the northwest quadrant of Washington, D.C., around K to P streets, then somehow this, this set of theories gradually becomes more and more plausible to you. I've seen it happen. But it, it, it you know, just get them out of DC for a while, they can be detoxed. Uh, so, you know, Iran, if it got a weapon, is not going to use it any more than anybody else who has such a weapon has ever used it. Uh, and, it's, it's, and, and Iran is not going to give it to a terrorist group, and it's not the end of the world. And these threats that are being manufactured in people's minds for the United States are not actually such big threats. Thank you very much. My question is about Turkey. How do you see the change of the Turkish foreign policy from the zero problem with neighbors to the problems with Egypt, Syria, and, and, and Israel. So do you think, is it the, this is the nature of the problems in that region, or this is the change of the policy that affect the problems, that has to, that has to affect the problems? Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, it's a very good question about Turkey. Turkey, by the way, is uh, one of the major countries in the Middle East population-wise, uh, uh, roughly 70, million people, and um, it is uh, uh, the 16th largest economy in the world by GDP. Uh, so it's, it's part of the G20, it's it and Indonesia and Saudi Arabia are the only three Muslim countries in the G20. So Turkey has emerged, especially in the last decade, as a very major player on the world stage. Uh, and um, it is a member of NATO. Uh, the U.S. has excellent military relations with Turkey. And by the way, the U.S., by Article 5 of NATO, is pledged to defend Turkey from any attack. And likewise, Turkey fought with the U.S. and Korea. Uh, so uh, this, this is an ally. The U.S. doesn't have any other formal allies in the Middle East. Even Israel is not a formal ally. There's no treaty, no treaty specifying that we have to fight for, for Israel. Uh, but there is a treaty specifying that we have to defend Turkey uh, from attack. So it, it's, it's a very important country. And, uh, and, and in 2002, the Justice and Development Party came to power in Turkey. Uh, and the foreign minister, Ahmed Davutoglu, uh, had, uh, as was said, a uh, theory of international relations. And I think it's, it's a little bit influenced maybe by China in the sense that uh, the idea was you, you try to create a zone where you have no problem with your neighbors. Uh, you have peaceful relations with all of your immediate neighbors that are actually on your border. And then you try to grow your trade and, uh, and grow your economy and kind of fly under the radar with regard to conflict. You know, the Chinese basically have done this. And, and the, the, the Turks have, have done a pretty good job of it. They've had relatively high uh, economic growth rates. Uh, their trade has expanded tremendously. The Justice and Development Party, uh, its constituents were more conservative Muslims in Turkey. Uh, it wasn't necessary an Islamist party in the sense of its policies, but its constituents 
a lot of the women were veiled and, and so forth. And uh, Turkey is, you know, its framework is that of a secular society. So, um, that's a phone. Uh, so, uh, uh, Ahmed Devotolo's theory of zero problems with neighbors and growing trade, it all worked marvelously uh, until uh, 2011. Uh, but then problems started to develop because uh, once the civil war broke out in Syria, well, would you really not take a side in that? Would you just declare neutrality? What if Bashar al-Assad is killing large numbers of his own population? More especially, what if he is a Shiite killing large numbers of Sunnis and Turkey is a largely Sunni country? So Davutoglu and, and Prime Minister Erdogan felt that they had to call for Bashar al-Assad to step down. Uh, well, that's not zero problems with neighbors. That's, that's a very severe involvement in a neighbor's civil war. And then uh, now, you know, the Muslim fundamentalists came to power the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt in, by elections in 2012. And in July 3rd, there was a military coup against them. And now they have been banned and driven underground and killed and arrested in large numbers. Uh, well, that party, the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, is a little bit kindred spirit to at least the, many of the constituents of the Justice and Development Party, so they couldn't take that lying down either, and they had to denounce the Egyptian military, and they denounced it in no uncertain terms, uh, very undiplomatically. Uh, you know, Taliban said that, a, a, that a, 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 for a diplomat, um, Yes is yes, maybe is no, and no means you're not a diplomat. Uh, so Turkey said no to Egypt. It was, it was a very undiplomatic. Uh, and uh, so we've got uh, bad relations with, uh, with Syria. There had been bad relations with Iraq. It had a Shia government that, uh, 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 that uh, has problems with Sunnis. Uh, their, their difficulties... Uh, uh, with Egypt. So this entire, and then even with the United States, so this entire uh, uh, no problems with neighbors policy has collapsed. Now, I, I think it was because that it was an unrealistic policy. Uh, I think it only worked as long as there weren't any problems with the neighbors. When there were problems with the neighbors, then you couldn't have that policy anymore. Uh, so, uh, I, I, Ahmed Davutoglu is a very smart man, uh, but they sometimes say, you know, intellectuals don't make the best, best politicians because they, they have highfalutin theories that don't, don't necessarily march with reality. Uh, so far, Turkey hasn't suffered a lot from these changes. Its economy is still going to grow 3% this year. In fact, it benefited in some ways because, you know, the Middle East, one of its major industries is tourism. And all of a sudden, do you really want to go to a military dictatorship like Egypt on your vacation? Or Tunisia is maybe a little bit out of control, and white sand beaches in La Marsa don't look so good. And, and uh, Syria, you know, you're not exactly going to go off to, uh, to Palmyra right about now. So where would you go if you were going to do tourism in a warm place in the Middle East? Smyrna, I Izmir, uh, you would go to, to Turkey. Uh, and especially the former Soviet bloc, the Eastern Europeans and the Russians and the Ukrainians and so forth, tremendous numbers of them are coming to Antalya uh, and, and, and elsewhere in Turkey. And then some of the Western European tourist market has shifted there too. So they've, they've actually, in a way, benefited economically from some of these, this instability. Thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, I think I have a couple of points. First of all, uh, the way you explained all the stories of wars in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Pakistan, in many other countries that has been going on. Well, I, on the one hand, I really enjoyed your comprehensive uh, presentation on them. And at the same time, I realized that probably is another crucial part of the story that uh, was missing, which is the people. Could you uh, kiss the mic? I, I can't hear you. I think it's, it's, you. Yeah, you have to speak into it. Okay, so the story of the people of those war-torn countries, I thought, were missing. One estimate 
shows as as my memory uh, you know, tells me right now was in Iraq it was around two million people were killed in Iraq only and we can imagine the number would be if we you know accumulate all the numbers in in many different countries so yes we heard about the diplomacy we heard about the political alliances and strategic calculations but what happened on the ground, people who faced those wars, people who lost their lives, the relatives and their homes and all those devastating consequences. So I would like you to, if you can touch on that briefly. And my second point is about the drone wars or the drone strikes. Uh, I would like, to, like you to talk specifically on two points. First of all, uh, Mr. John Brennan, who used to lead this, uh, as far I know. He was kind of adamant in saying that no, those who have been protesting, saying that no, these drone strikes are not really killing so-called terrorists, they are killing innocent people a lot. He was like adamant saying, no, you guys are wrong, you don't, you don't know really. And you know, so many horrific news we have been hearing, so let's say this disposition matrix, the signature killing, you know, these are really horrible. And I mean, I would like you to, if you, uh, if your time allows, uh, talk a little bit about these, these two points. First of all, this, this arrogance that no, we are wrong. We don't really know. On the other hand, this devastating plan. It seems like that it might extend to the domestic affairs in the U.S. too. Well, with regard to the social history of these uh, developments. Uh, I, I treat it in great length at, in the book, uh, so I would just recommend you read the Iraq chapter. Uh, I have given all of the uh, statistics and the, uh, I've talked about the particular social movements uh, that opposed U.S. occupation and uh, so forth. I spent a lot of time as a social historian working on these kinds of things. So it wasn't my, it wasn't my, uh, my subject today. Uh, I was looking more at the foreign policy. Uh, but uh, with regard to drones, you know, for me, the, the issue with drones is not whether they kill a certain number of civilians or not. I mean, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism uh, estimates that uh, U.S. drones in northern Pakistan, uh, which have targeted uh, the Pakistani Taliban and remnants of al-Qaeda that escaped there, uh, probably have killed somewhat over 2,000 uh, uh, people in, uh, since 2001. Uh, but uh, about 400 of them civilians. Uh, it, it, the U.S. maintains that, that that's an exaggeration, that it wasn't that many civilians. But I don't, for me, that, you know, it, it, the, the civilian casualties or the percentage of those killed who are civilians is not the, the, the big issue here. Uh, for me, the issue is um, the rule of law. War is pretty lawless, and uh, when you go to war, probably a lot of the laws of war are going to be disregarded. But we do have the Geneva Conventions. We have uh, uh, we, we have tried to establish a body of law uh, that was what was so outrageous about what happened in Syria. I mean, over 100,000 people have been killed in Syria, and the world community didn't do anything about that. But the use of chemical weapons was seen as a red line because there's a very strict a rule against that in international law, which goes back to the 1920s. Uh, so we've tried to establish laws about war, and the United States legal system has tried to establish laws about war. About, you know, at one point at least, it was forbidden by, by law, by Congress, th that the U.S. should assassinate people. Well, those days are long gone, but uh, the problem with with drones, from my point of view, is that they are outside a framework of law. They are a form of assassination, um, and the people that are being assassinated are being designated as dangerous to the United States. And the only doctrine of law that's being invoked here is self-defense. Uh, in the United Nations Charter, all nations are given the right of self-defense if they're attacked. Uh, so, but it's, it's, these are preemptive attacks, right? So these, these are individuals who have been identified by the Obama administration, by the U.S. executive, 
as likely to attack the United States or as having been materially involved in attacks on, on the United States. Uh, and so then they're designated as enemy combatants and then they're blown away uh, in the sky. Well, there's no judges involved. There's no, no rules of evidence involved. There's no adversarial system involved. It's a decision of the executive. And at least four American citizens have been assassinated by the federal government in this way. Well, that worries me. I don't think that was what the founders were up to in the Constitution. Uh, it doesn't sound very much like the Bill of Rights to me. There are all kinds of provisions there for, you know, uh, warrants in arrest and uh, uh, speedy trial and uh, uh, trial by jury and, and all kinds of, of, of bulwarks against the tyranny of government. And I, I see drones as a recrudescence of the star chamber. Uh, they're very much like the kinds of practices that George III used, who was not the most powerful monarch, uh, but, but he was unconstrained in some ways. Uh, and I think the American president is, is becoming a king again. And this is he can just, you know, uh, the, um, there was a practice in, in 18th century in, in Britain uh, that went back a while, uh, whereby the king could designate somebody as an outlaw. We have the word outlaw now, and we use it about the Old West, and so but we've forgotten what it means. An outlaw was somebody that the king declared to be outside the law. And what he meant by that was that you could do anything to that person without repercussions. That was what an outlaw was. It was somebody outside the framework of civilized governance. So if you, if you saw an outlaw, and you wanted to just kill the outlaw, you could, and the sheriff wouldn't arrest you. Uh, if you wanted to steal from the outlaw, you could. Well, what's basically happening is that people are being declared outlaws by the Obama administration, and then they're being killed at will. Uh, and uh, it's being done by the CIA. And that's another problem, which it means that it's classified. So if you were in a press conference with Secretary of State John Kerry, uh, or with Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel, and you ask them, do you think that the drone program that the United States is running is compatible with the US Constitution? Do you know what their response would be? What drone program? We can neither confirm nor deny that there is a drone program. It's classified, it's being run by the CIA, it's a covert op. Well, what kind of, of democracy can you have when the US government is blowing away people overseas and we can't even discuss it with our elected representatives? Because it's classified. Uh, so, if you're gonna have a drone program, I would insist that it not be in the hands of the CIA, that it be in the Defense Department, because the Defense Department is actually under congressional scrutiny, and, and you can ask them uh, uh, about it, and you can control it a little bit. Uh, and I would insist that it be done in the framework of a bilateral treaty. Now we know from WikiLeaks, from the State Department cables, that the US went to the Pakistani Prime Minister and said, we want to blow people away in your country, is it all right? And the Pakistani Prime Minister said, well, sure, but you know I will have to denounce you in public. And the Americans said, okay, we'll take the hit. And exactly the same story was, is told in the WikiLeaks cables from Yemen. Ali Abdullah Saleh told General David Petraeus, you drone those guys as much as you like, I'll say it's, it's my planes that are killing them. I'll give you cover. So, you know, the, the outrage you hear sometimes from the countries where these things are happening is, is a little, you know, they do protest too much, as Shakespeare said. It, it, in fact, there's a lot of behind the scenes collusion on all this. And it, one of the demands of the Pakistani military has not been that the drones stop being used against what they consider terrorists in the federally administrated tribal areas of the north, but rather that the U.S. give 
the Pakistani military drones so that they can drone them themselves. And that's another worry that I have, which is that it's bad enough that the U.S. is acting in this essentially lawless way, uh, but this is going to proliferate. And there, I can think of countries that I would just as soon not have drones that they could use at will to blow people away. So um, my main concern here is, is the lawlessness of the whole thing and the extra constitutionality of it. And it is worrisome because it is uh, yet one more phenomenon in a whole series of phenomena of lawlessness and extra constitutionality on behalf of the U.S. executive that the NSA spying is, is a part of, the drones are a part of, covert operations are a part of, and so on and so forth, which I think are incompatible with democracy and probably destructive of it over time. Our last question. Hi, thanks. Um, you spoke about Syria intervention optically through like the Syrian perspective, I'm sorry, through the Saudi perspective. Uh, but what I'm looking for is, do you think it would be or would have been in the United States foreign policy interest to intervene? And would a fall of the Assad regime um, be beneficial uh, to America, at least from a foreign policy perspective? Right. So uh, Syria is, um, is a, a, a situation where there's always an, a one, on the one hand and on the other hand. It's, it's a very complicated situation. Uh, on the one hand, the Bashar al-Assad government uh, has uh, committed crimes against humanity. In international law, one war crime is a war crime. A whole pattern, a whole systematic set of war crimes becomes a crime against humanity. The Syrian government is by now certainly guilty of crimes against humanity, and if it were a signatory of the, uh, of the Rome Statute, it could be brought before the International Criminal Court in The Hague and indicted for crimes against humanity. So it's very undesirable that that government survive. I mean, having a murderous kind of government that's guilty of crimes against humanity in power is bad. Uh, on the other hand, um, I warned you about that, uh, the Rebellion against that government is extremely divided and fractured, and uh, the best fighters uh, have tended to be the most extreme. Uh, we now think that of the territory in northern Syria that has been liberated from the government and where rebels uh, uh, hold sway, 75% of it is probably in the hands of, uh, of, of Sunni radical extremists, some of whom have openly declared uh, that they are affiliates of Al-Qaeda. Well, you certainly wouldn't want that to spread to the rest of the country, and you wouldn't want those guys to take over Damascus. Uh, so, you know, could you intervene in such a way as some hope that you would encourage an alternative group of good guys to outflank the Sunni extremists and also overthrow the, frankly, genocidal Ba'ath government. By the way, of the 100,000 that have died, or 115,000 that have died in this conflict, uh, the best estimates of the, uh, uh, of the UN are that uh, uh, probably slightly more have been killed by the rebels than have been killed by the regime. So but the, the thing is, the rebels are themselves not one thing, so you can't put your finger on a particular uh, government there that's, that's guilty of crimes against humanity. But there are commanders in the rebel side who are guilty of crimes against humanity. And there have been massacres of Shiite villages, of Christian villages. Uh, there have been uh, uh, severe uh, human rights abuses in, uh, in, in Sufi and modern uh, uh, and, and moderate Sunni areas and so forth at the hands of these, uh, you know, self-proclaimed Al-Qaeda. Uh, so, um, personally, I'm, I'm doubtful. I think what, we, you, what you can see in Afghanistan and, and Iraq and elsewhere in Pakistan, 
once you flood weapons into a place, or Libya is another example, the weapons are on a market. They go wherever the market wants them to go. Uh, weapons are, are very marketized. Uh, uh, and uh, so um, uh, I saw this happen in Pakistan back in the 80s. The, the CIA decided to get the Soviets out of Afghanistan, which they had uh, occupied, and uh, flooded weapons into Afghanistan through Pakistan. And then you started seeing these weapons show up in the markets in Pakistan. And I, I had seen similar things happen in the 70s in Lebanon, and I thought to myself, well, that's a civil war waiting to happen. And then, of course, security in Pakistan has gotten worse and worse and worse. So the idea that you could give weapons to the, to the good guy rebels, and those weapons wouldn't fall into the hands of the Al-Qaeda types, or that you wouldn't end up with a highly weaponized society like Iraq, where all this time, after the American invasion, things are still being blown up and people are being killed. In fact, more people have probably died in Iraq uh, in the past five months from political violence than died in Syria. And that's after the U.S. invaded and overthrew its, its government and ruled it directly for several years. So if, if they weren't able to forestall these things in Iraq, and if they just created Probably, you know, an insurgency lasts a good 10 to 15 years. So we probably, you're, you're talking about the 2020s before things settle down in Iraq. If, if we weren't able to do any better a job than that in Iraq, what makes anybody think that if the U.S. got directly involved in Syria, that it would be able to tamp down things? You know, these, this kind of fighting doesn't occur at a level where the U.S. Air Force or even army is able to, to do anything about it. It happens in back alleys, it happens at a micro level, and a foreign, foreign military force is probably helpless before it. Um, so it's a horrible thing. You know, I, I have lots of Syrian friends. I've, I've been in Syria, and I, I, it, it, it hurts me what's happening. But after what happened in Iraq, I have become uh, very doubtful that a direct intervention necessarily going to make anything any better. And, uh, and now, you know, uh, I, I supported the intervention in Libya, but uh, I have to admit, you know, it's going to hell in a handbasket right about now, partly because the Qataris sent a lot of weapons in, uh, which I wouldn't have advised. So um, I think it's, it's, it's a very difficult foreign policy issue, and my guess is the U.S. is not going to get involved in it. Well, I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Cole, for speaking with us for the last couple hours. Um, it's disturbing. <laughs> it's disturbing. But we all will continue studying the region and studying the language so we can understand it and to continue to explore possibilities of, um, of peace and growth. I don't know what else to say. Thank you so much. Let's give him a round of applause. And we'll see some of you at the Muslims in a Global Context uh, on Friday. That's right. Thank you.